Hello and welcome everyone to episode 15, season two of Digitales. My name is Fazan Sayed, founder and CEO of East River. And today I have a guest who is a TED fellow, someone who has a very famous project under her company called Uptrade. The project is known as Goats for Water. She's had over a decade of experience in the energy sector, working in different countries in the MENA region, but she's transited out from being an energy specialist into an entrepreneur, into someone who herds livestock. Ferial Salahuddin, how are you today? I am good, Fezan, and good to be here, and I'm excited about this. Amazing. You've transited out of energy, and you are now, as you said, a livestock herder. Yeah, I call How myself a goat herder. A goat herder. How did you yeah. give up that cushy, comfortable air-conditioned office to hang out with goats all day? You know, it wasn't it wasn't that much of a difficult decision, but it's a, it's an interesting story. I never thought I would I would be an entrepreneur or I would run a business. In fact, I hadn't even I didn't even know the term. Uh, all the terms that go along with this particular uh, sort of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, way of life such as social entrepreneur or boot camp or an accelerator uh, but it's just that the work kind of found me and uh -huh. uh, and I was uh, kind of in the field looking at solar I came across villages came across this solution found the work just extremely gratifying being able to see the impact of your day-to-day -day work really translating on the ground uh, was hugely influential in me leaving the cushy air-conditioned office job and becoming an entrepreneur and building this company up. So that's the short version of it. Um, it's interesting you're saying, so you were in the energy space looking at renewable energy when you saw a problem that those in the remote areas who needed renewable energy were facing, right? Right, right. So I actually happened to be in those areas uh, exploring for a solution for energy. But what I came across was that, wow, there are people who don't even have access to basic, basic necessity. Like right. And found out that it was the same hurdle which was preventing them from accessing uh, water that was the same hurdle that was preventing them from accessing something like electricity mm -hmm. uh, was affordability. And uh, that's that's when we came up with the Goats for Water project, which became quite famous, um, where we started taking what the communities did have instead of cash. And what they did have was, was a lot of goats. Um, so we started taking the goats as payment instead of cash. And they then could purchase assets which gave them water, electricity, and now we're doing f f fertilizer, smartphones. Wow. Yeah. And is there a precedent for this? Like, how, how did that idea actually come into your head that, you know what, maybe I'll just take their goats and give them something in return? Did you see a precedent like this? Or has any other market done something like this? No, I had not seen a pre pre precedent like this. Uh, but I know now, after working in this, that that is how most or quite a few communities which are living in these rural settings that's how they generally do transactions right. it's just that we have formalized it we have now digitized it so they're but, still living in the past and they're still trading assets like livestock and let's say commodities like let's say wheat and cotton yeah yeah exactly you know um that uh, it's it's interesting to kind of we kind of have to keep like we've really grown up in these very uh, sort of tight-laced mainstream economic systems. And we have to take a little bit of a um, sort of leap of imagination and think about okay, if you're living in an economy where there's really not much you can buy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and there's only so much that you can, that you need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what will you do with money? Right? What do you need money for? So someone said, oh, I'll buy your goat, but I'll buy it for, say, a, a ludicrous amount, right? Say a million dollars. But this, this community or a household in this community, like they will be, I would say, stretched to 
really understand what can be done with billion dollars in cash. They're very wouldn't direct. Skill. I mean, wouldn't they want to sort of get the amenities of life in their village or wherever they live? Yeah, absolutely. They would like. They would want water. They would want electricity. Uh, they would want, uh, you know, the 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 assets that go along with life, which make life easier. A fridge, which is a lot, which is what a lot of people would ask for. Mm -hmm. But in 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 an ecosystem where none of these things are actually available in or around you, you'd have to mm -hmm. leave where you live to go and find these, right? Now and so they don't, they're not comfortable with leaving or moving on from where they are. They've been there for hundreds of years. I can't, I can't speak for that, but you know, a lot of and a lot of people do like they aspire to the to the idea that oh, we're going to go into the city and we're going to make this living, but it in, but it uh, but it still has this huge uh, emotional cost of leaving what is familiar. Right. I think most people, when given the choice or would rather have uh, the amenities made available to where where we are living so that we don't have to leave our loved ones. We don't have to leave what we call home and what we've mm -hmm. known as home for generations uh, to go and find those amenities. But I mean, a lot of us do. I mean, mm -hmm. there are many people who, you know, uh, like my family members who've done that, we know people who've done that. Um, it's it's a it's a human f phenomena, but uh, I don't think it's. A, I think if 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 people could have all of those amenities, those freedoms, I don't think people would leave. True, and so now once you've 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 taken let's say the livestock, right? You know, what's the business model? Because, I mean, there's got to be an insurance component to this because livestock is livestock. I mean, it can get affected with disease. You can lose the assets, so to speak. So how do you protect yourself? How does the business model work? Mm -hmm. So the business model, the way it works is that we then take those livestock and then we sell them. When we first started, we used to only sell at Eid. And that's, as you very correctly pointed out, there's a whole insurance issue, right? Mm -hmm. uh, livestock would die, they would get lost, they would go grazing and never come mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we figured, you know, we have to wait one whole year to recover the cash. And that was really like a hurdle to really scaling up our work. We, were, we had communities who were like, hey, we also want this. And we're like, well, you'll have to wait till next year. We, we don't have the cash now. Mm -hmm. So then we started selling live animals to meat companies. Uh, and then we decided, ke, achha, why don't we just launch our own meat line, which we did last year, and it's mm -hmm. called Go for Water Meat. Um, and we now sell meat throughout the year. Wow. Okay. Then also figured out, ke, um, achha, you know, different communities have different needs. Right. So this particular in Tharparkar, water is an issue, but we've just started in Jamshoro. They've got a lot of water, but they still need solar lighting, solar fans. Um, they want fertilizer, right? So now we are introducing all of these new products. Offerings because, and stuff, yeah, yes. Exactly. And then we also asked ourselves, okay, how come we can sell this animal at this price, but the farmer doesn't get this money? Yeah. So that kind of made the whole livestock value chain opened up to us, right? And we're like, oh, this is super inefficient. This is, you know, it's like a huge part. It's about 13% of the Pakistan's uh, GDP agriculture is, of which livestock is a huge component. Big and important. we have this sector which is completely um, informal. It is fragmented. It is inefficient. So why don't we streamline from the farm to fork? Right. So started something called eMundi where we are connecting or we buy from farmers and we sell and we sell through our own meat line we sell through uh, we sell to large grocery chains restaurants uh, in addition to the barter model and this is processed meat you're talking about you process the meat and then you sell it yeah we process the meat and then we sell it interesting so we so, okay so you've created an offshoot that's no longer just trading the goats and selling the goats on eve will process the meat and on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, have multiple streams in which they can be, let's say, offloaded. 
Absolutely. And also the interesting thing is that there are, you know, varying qualities of animals right. uh, which have different markets. So we've kind of now gotten to that point where we know which animal will go where. Okay, so you're now you have a categorization system. So you basically yeah. are able to figure out which animal gets, you know, sort of processed, packaged, which one lets maybe be sold somewhere else for some other purpose. Yeah. And now, in fact, we we are, um, you know, we developed an app basically, which was for our internal use because we were getting a number of animals and we needed to evaluate it. Okay, ye bakra, uh, if this is like X months old, that is Y months old, what is the difference in pricing, right? So we so we came up with that, uh, which was being used internally. But and now we are kind of launching that for farmers to be able to use and for buyers to be able to use. Mm hmm. Interesting. And so you're not restricted anymore to the kind of livestock you are taking in. You're taking in everything. Yeah, we can take in. We started with goats. Mm -hmm. We've done cows. Uh, that just sounds wrong. But yeah, we've transacted <laughs> in cows. Uh, we, uh, we got offered camels. Right. Uh, but we, you know, like a camel is a, we, we're now looking into camels for the export market. Uh, but yeah, I would love to kind of transact with a camel to camel for water or like yeah. Yeah, something. And no chickens or nothing and no other livestock that's out there? That No chickens, we don't do uh, barter because uh, chickens are not grown. I mean, no, they're not. They're just too many chickens to a, to a solar system, to a solar home life. Okay. okay, got it. The equivalency valuation becomes a problem. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You know, it's you don't think like this on a daily basis. It's a very unique uh, problem to be solving. And so my next question is that couldn't this apply to fruits and vegetables too? I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you why. Because I was in Turbat and Panjgur and I was looking for dates for one of the uh, other products that we create. And I was speaking to a date farmer and he said, I will give you and the, the government mandated rate was 2000 rupees for a month, so I think 45 kg. So I said, okay, it's 2000 for a month. How much will you give it to me for? He said, look, give me a thousand bucks. I said, why would you sell it to me at below the government rate? He said, well, if you don't buy it from me, it's going to lie here on the floor and it's going to be eaten by my goats. So I'd rather get the thousand rupees than get nothing at all. I mean, I ended up giving the guy a lot more than that because, you know, I, mean, I just saw their conditions. It was terrible. Yeah. But I saw tons of dates, tons being wasted that way yeah. because there was just that inefficiency in connecting the produce to the end consumer, to the buyer. And I was like, you've got to have a system where you can trade this or store it or do something with it. Right. Because dates are a very high nutrition product commodity that we can easily use to create nutrition solutions for those impoverished areas. Absolutely, Fezan. And yeah, you can. You can totally use produce as well. And what you've hit upon is is something really important for for the agriculture economy of Pakistan. There's a lot of food waste. And this is what you experience with dates is um, I kind of came across this. We just moved into Jamshoro and Jamshoro made, you know, right right now we're, we're like harvesting um, wheat. And there we had gone to talk about goats and how we're going to, you know, how we're going to give them market connectivity, how we're going to give them solar. And, and they, and they were like, listen, can you, can you help us sell wheat? And I said, I can look into it, but tell me, what do you need? And he said, you know, we have to actually sell our wheat. We end up selling our wheat for prices that are lower than the government uh, prescribed rates. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd like to get higher rates. And I said, why do you, that he said because we don't have a place to store we don't have a place to store this wheat and so that this this happened literally i think four or five weeks ago so we're actually now starting the process of looking into the wheat value chain and to be able to see Kiatra, how can we facilitate the farmers in getting their wheat to market also can we take wheat as payment um and i don't know if you know about this but um, the state bank came up with this pretty cool project uh, which is warehouse financing uh, okay. for for crops which i think is so important for pakistan uh, 
and what they're going to do is they're going to they're giving sub subsidized rates for for anyone to put up uh, warehousing for right. for rice for grains for dates for fruit well not for fruit but dry goods dry um, right. and and a farmer can come and uh, put his um, produce there and get an invoice against which instead of having you know he might not want to sell it then but he has a place to keep it and against that invoice he can get a loan uh, from the bank wow okay interesting which, yeah which really takes care of the primary issue ki you don't have to sell immediately at a really yeah. really low price and what that has led to is hoarding right so you have people who buy at who kind of take advantage of you know or not take advantage i wouldn't say they take advantage but some of them do i'm sure where right. where they buy the crops when they're being harvested and keep them and hoard them and then kind of let them into the market the prices right. increase so i thought this was a really good solution the state bank has come up with what a what an interesting digital solution to an analog problem because i mean if you think about cryptocurrency i mean it's sort of the same thing that they're taking coins that you hold you can pledge your coin and take a loan in dollars against that coin so you don't have to sell the coin to be able to use the money you wait yeah. for the coin value to go up and then using the increased valuation you're able to pay down your loan same thing it seems like it's happening here with wheat yeah and think about it think about what what is money for us now or what it used to be before before bretton woods happened right um it was a piece of paper which said that this is equivalent of this much gold right. absolutely silver, right and that gold and silver is kept in a warehouse somewhere and theoretically i know that oh if i ever want it i can go and exchange it that's precisely what is now happening with the um, with this warehouse financing you have a piece of paper the farmer has saying that this is this is um, you know this is equivalent of this much wheat and i'm getting money against it yes that's true so this really i mean this is what actually my ted talk is about um uh, which got re released just last week that i think in the time and space that we're living in as as humanity we are again finding ourselves at that um sort of uh, what's the term that fulcrum or that pivotal moment where we're reimagining uh what money is right um and now as we think about digital currencies and we think about cryptos and alternate coins we actually have the means to go back to that time when barter was the way we of the world everything happened in barter yeah and you would be able to create three way four way barters because you could exchange things in different everything would have a different exchange right absolutely and think about what that does for inflation right what is inflation that will actually take care of inflation this whole idea of hyperinflation which is happening globally right uh if we have commodity uh sort of um pegged uh currencies the idea of inflation kind of falls away because you'll be exchanging exactly what you need and with with like what you have which has finite value at the back it is so why isn't that the case today I and mean, you've studied the policy around this um you studied international finance you would actually have the answer why isn't currency pegged to commodity we consume so i i can't so this is something um that i haven't studied but i've studied it independently because when i started doing this as my day to day work taking livestock right. as payment i started looking into this so it's interesting fazan why are we not so you know yuval hariri puts it in a really interesting way that um everything is an agreed imagined contract so so money is what we have collectively agreed to um ke ha this exists right we all sort of i don't know how to explain it let me be a little bit um let me think about it how to how to communicate this because the idea is mind blowing everything at the end of the day is uh is is kind of like a 
collective community agreement where we've all agreed that this we now all believe in. What would so the imagined order concept, concept that he talks about, right? So we've all yeah. collectively imagined some. So the idea around a private limited company, that a private yeah. limited company is a person in itself with the rights of a person, right? With, let's say, limited liability and so on. And so the reason we believe in all of this is because we believe in it together. Precisely. And now... That take that. Yeah. And now we are kind of in the process of slowly as the entire like groups of humanity countries moving towards this idea that oh we might not need a centrally like a central bank run money system anymore uh, we might be able to have multiple currencies which are denominated in different assets or cryptocurrencies even right uh, it's just about breaking away from one system of belief which has been there for us for many like hundreds of years so to break away from that collectively and then to start following another another sort of um agreed upon system so that okay. i think takes time but we're almost there i think so, you, so the, it's it's interesting how you're linking this entire concept of let's say commodity based currencies to what is Web 3.0, right? Web 3 is all about decentralization. The whole notion is because digital connectivity has equalized the world, because we all have, most of us have access to the internet and a good access to the internet. Therefore, we are all now one community. Within that one community, we can break up into sub communities and each sub community can sort of take care of itself if it if the decision making on various topics is decentralized to them right yeah it's and exactly. that's the same concept that you're talking about and so you're right if this happens on the commodity front technically you solve for inflation yeah yeah and you solve for you know there's no uh, the whole point is that these are communities that we are working in that have nothing like they're so far removed from our economic systems but this would totally, this way of living could, it's, it kind of democratizes everyone, right? There's no, it kind of breaks away the classes, it breaks away the cultures because everyone has similar needs and similar uh, resources or the way we use and Even them. from the financing point that you talked about, let's say the, the, the farmer who's getting financing against wheat. I mean, today, if you try to get financing, the bank gets to decide who gets financing. Tomorrow, any coin holder gets financed immediately yeah. you know yeah. because they can save the coin and they're like okay we'll give you financing against the coin for the value that that coin has today precisely so and the value goes down we either call it back and you pay it back or if the value goes up you, you get an increased uh, you know credit but no one gets a no exactly and and the verification is also being done uh, um it's not some it's not a central right. authority anymore like it's okay. on the blockchain. Yeah, you've got the blockchain because that right. is verifiable and you don't need someone putting a stamp, ke haan, yeah. you know, their, their wheat is lying with us. You don't even need that eventually. So, if, so what you're basically saying is that in our next evolution of digitization, we're actually taking a step back and going back into time and we're becoming like the sort of historical communities. Kind of, yeah. We are actually thinking about, I think we can totally imagine, uh, or rather what we, a better way of transacting, making it, bringing it to the 21st century by digitizing it, right? Bringing barter back, basically. Bringing barter back. What a great hashtag. I love it. it. Bringing barter <laughs> back. Yeah, I, think, I think we may have created something today <laughs> together, as so tell me, you also are a TED fellow. How, how does one become a TED fellow? And you gave a great TED talk, you know, you spoke about this, how, you know, I know a lot of people have done these TEDx talks, right? But you actually did the TED fellowship and then you gave a talk. If someone wanted to go down that path, how, what's the guidance you give? How do they do it? Um, the way to do it is that uh, they have an application process. And if you feel there's something uh, which you're working on, which really needs to go out there, um, you apply. Uh, the TED community is 
is really one of, it's really remarkable how welcoming and how open uh, the community is. And even the interview, so you go through an interview, you have to have uh, two people recommend your work. Mm -hmm. And uh, not just your work, but also you as a person. It's really okay. interesting. Uh, it's, it's actually one of the most interesting application processes I've ever gone through and the interview process. Um, and um, and then the program itself kind of uh, brings, like really preps you for, for launching this talk and this idea to the world. And um, it's just an amazing group of people. I highly, highly recommend it to anyone who feels that they're working on something which really should be out there to go for it. And anyone can apply for any project. Anyone, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they have people who will recommend uh, you or, you know, from their own network and community, like past fellows or past speakers. In my case, I happen to meet uh, this really amazing person who I now am really proud to call my friend, this person called Rob Reed. Mm -hmm. um, he he is he's an inventor. He runs a podcast much like yours, but okay. it is on... Uh, it's on, he covers like science and technology. It's interesting, okay. you should do it. And he writes uh, fiction. But we happened to meet um, at, um, at a startup judging competition where we were both jury members in Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. And I told him about my work and he was like, oh, you should definitely like, you know, speak at TED. And he had already spoken a number of times. And that's how I got connected. That's how I found out about Interesting. it. Interesting. Interesting. So tell me this, you know, you switched out of a career in sort of the very traditional energy sector, right? And you moved into a path of, let's say, sustainability, evolving sort of environments uh, and markets. Um, my question is, People who are thinking about a career in global sustainability, do you think sustainability in itself is a sustainable career path? Oh my God, I love it! I love it how you put that. <laughs> because I mean, it's you know, it's it's the you know, it's the catch of the day. It's hot today, but you know, at the end of the day, I mean, look, all big corporations have to focus on. They call it the triple bottom line, but we all know that one bottom line makes more sort of waves than the other, right? Yeah. So. Is it really sustainable, a career in sustainability? A career in sustainability. Look, both of these, both the words that make up this term, a career and sustainability. Right? Yeah. A career is, again, one of those, uh, one of those constructs that we have been taught. What is a career? Like when okay. I started out, like I had a very clear idea that I'm going to get a job with a corporate or I'm going to get right. a job with a multilateral development bank and I'm going to rise through the ranks. And um, thankfully, uh, you know, I kind of, I mean, it was a difficult time of my in, in my life where I kind of figured out that, oh, you know, you don't have your career or your career path doesn't have to look a certain way. There's many ways to actually honor your own um, sort of passions and honor what your skills are and uh, and kind of live in a way which makes you happy and fulfills you. Um, so this whole idea of a career, career in sustainability, right? That's what we call mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So first of all, a career itself is like nothing, right? That's right you make it out to be and sustainability i think sustainability is a way of life and even though i'm supposed to be in sustainability i don't think i live very sustainably uh, right right well, um, see, it is a way of life and so if you're picking a, a way to earn a living mm -hmm. in a way of life then you should be living that way too you can't be, let's say, you know, a head of sustainability at, you know, sort of, you know, uh, Eng, uh, Exxon, whatever, uh, oil and gas company. Yeah. Yet living a non-sustainable life, right? Like then technically you're sort of contradicting yourself. That's what yeah. I mean. Like how, yeah. because, you know, everyone talks about it, but I don't see it 
translate the way it should in the actions of the individuals who occupy those positions absolutely and i also don't see it translate in even the institutions that are built for sustainability right or right. for fighting poverty for example uh, right. i see and that was i also one of the reasons why i feel like um the institutional drive towards fighting poverty fighting for sustainability you need a lot of money to fight poverty yeah and there's a lot of waste i think sustainability yeah. primarily means don't waste resources yeah starting yeah. with water starting with uh, going on to money or whatever resources that are kind of that are put in your way just right. use them carefully right so i mean i see a lot of institutional waste in the places where i've kind of i've seen a lot of good come out of it as well but i have seen a lot of waste a waste of resources of people's time of money uh, that an institution has been entrusted with to fight poverty which is actually going into lobbying or building consensus or policy which is yes important but also projects which are just kind of putting a jewel in the crown of the manager mm. but is it really having an impact for the country and for the people that you're meant to be serving right so so how do you how do you measure that efficiency because there's a lot of uh, talk around ngos and efficiency and the dollar sort of raised by the ngo how much of that dollar actually makes its way to the individuals for whom the ngo is serving right how what's a good way for anyone looking to sort of work in that sector to think about efficiency in your mind I don't know if I can if I have an answer for you for that. I, this is just what I've observed. I'm also standing in the same place where you are observing mm -hmm. this. I think it would be um it would be good for someone to think about this and figure out, you know, are we on the right path? Right. I think really for, for the institutions that are um that are now at the forefront of this or have been, I would say not any more so much. uh to really reevaluate are we really doing what we are meant to be doing in the best way possible or are we kind of lost interesting where do you see up trade in the next 5 years oh in the next 5 years i would like to see up trade definitely all over pakistan in the villages i would like to see our meat shops all over the country i would like to see amit shops not just in the country but outside of the country selling exporting pakistani meat which is really good quality meat it we just like traceability is a big thing so we would be building this idea of tra traceability of meat that is coming from impact um origins projects not just in pakistan but say in somalia say in kenya and this meat which can be traced back ke you know this meat came from an animal that was traded for this asset for this community interesting and the traceability you talk about is being able to trace the meat to where it came from whether it came from a region where certain impact was created or was is there something else also to the traceability so yeah for for sure the impact side that's that's the usp for us but for pakistan and for other de de developing countries our livestock and our meat actually is kind of um limited to certain geographies because we don't have something called tra traceability that which geographic areas did this right. animal or meat go through therefore like we just had the lumpy skin disease which right. broke right. in okay. certain regions if we could have said that this piece of meat came from this uh, region which had no breakout imagine because that was a huge loss right for uh, for it. the meat is for the restaurants and how so, difficult is it to establish traceability is that a complicated uh, task no it's not we're already working on expensive to do I would say is it expensive to it's slightly expensive to it's time consuming because true tra traceability actually requires two generations um of your of your animal going back but but having said that you know like it's um it's not something which is very difficult i think uh, 
it's been done all over the world we are doing it because we actually stumbled up, up, upon it because we needed to figure out the value of each animal that we were taking as our payment and part of that was also origin so we've got that and we've got like all the key characteristics of an animal so we were like oh we've actually introduced traceability mm. without knowing or intending without to do knowing it. it right and how, what percentage of the meat produced in pakistan actually is traceable no right now we don't have traceability at all at all there's none no because as soon as the animal gets to the mandi that's it you don't know where it originated right right okay so the concept of being able to tag the animal to a certain location that from doesn't... where it was born where was was born. Like, where were its parents where were its grandparents itti to hamare paas human beings ke liye traceable let's start there first <laughs> yeah. yeah we okay. don't have birth records of human beings so i think <laughs> Yeah. So I mean, imagine how much value we're leaving on the table there. You yeah. know, in terms of export value that we could potentially have. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Interesting chat, Feryal. Really, really interesting stuff. Uh, not just some of the stuff that I've been typically talking about, but for me, it was fascinating because you know, not a lot of people. In fact, no one else I know is focused on this sector and is able to, is able to bridge sort of the value system. of the rural economy with what could work in an urban center right and i think you've done a great job with that especially creating meat outlets i hope you i wish you all the success with that i think it's a fantastic idea and i would i would say you should think of an ipo in the next 5 years i think this is a very yeah, i definitely have the thoughts i'm <laughs> glad you said it i'm <laughs> glad you said it you know in my pitch deck that's out there <laughs> perfect Thank you. And uh, everyone please check out the uh, link to Farrell's TED Talk. It's in our comment section below. Uh, do check it out. Thank you all for tuning in. See you next week. Thank you Farrell for the chat. Really enjoyed myself. Thanks. Bye-bye.